Okay, okay. So we're going to do lecture number 7A, which is on database connectivity and database applications that are related to Oracle. Because what is the use of using a database if you can't connect it to an application or use it somehow in your uh, development? Uh, so this is what the lecture is about. The motivation uh, for using internet databases and database and the design of applications, the architecture, and then seven steps to use JDBC, essentially, to show you how easy it is. Uh, because this is not a Java programming course, uh, I'm not going to really get into the Java syntax, but a lot of you guys are software engineering majors or computer science majors, so you're uh, going to hopefully explore, if you don't, haven't explored Java yet, Java is like one of the biggest internet languages out there, used for a lot of internet development, so it's a natural kind of language to use with JDBC, and JDBC is just like ODBC. ODBC is Object Database Connectivity or Object Database that's made by Microsoft originally, well not Microsoft, but third party vendors, works with Microsoft, works with other operating systems, it allows you to connect to databases from local applications on the client side, which is ODBC Object Database, uh, which treats the database as an object, allows you to, you know, connect it with a widget, uh, let's say in Visual Studio or Vis Visual Basic, Visual uh, C++. Uh, primarily in Microsoft development environments. JDBC is the flip side of that, used with the Java development environment, cross-platform compatibility. But JDBC actually connects through Java database connectivity, done again by third parties, not made by Oracle, not made by Sun, not made by, well, actually Sun does make a couple of them, but long story short, <coughs> it's third party tools that are used to connect databases to internet applications, which is what I'm talking about today. Look at a sample program, and then look at the metadatabase concept. Did I cover PLSQL in this class? Procedural language? Okay, that's also on the, the agenda for today as well. I think I'll do PLSQL next, so if I remember. I just, I just had the thought, I don't know if I've done PLSQL, but that's another language which is really nice to use. PL is, stands for procedural language. Used with SQL is supported by the SQL Plus window in Oracle. So it's an Oracle tool specifically for Oracle. Still supported, still actually kind of popular. In fact, usually there's one or two people in the room that work to, to do this actually, it's consulting. Um, and it allows you to write programs in the MySQL window that are running in a programming language instead of using uh, you know, an SQL query, you're writing procedural statements that says, go to the database, update them with all this stuff. You can use variables, you can use data, um, you can take input, create output, do all sorts of different things like a real programming language with SQL mixed in with it. And it talks directly to the database. So we'll also look at that probably in the afternoon or um, perhaps maybe even this morning. So it depends on how long-winded I am with this lecture. It seems to be pretty long-winded so far. So let me just continue. Uh, motivation. Most popular form of database system is the relational database model. Structured query language is among the relational database uh, constructs for queries. Applications need to query the database. So there's a motivation to make it work. So a simple database application here. Not a bad lecture to kind of just kickstart our Oracle thinking for the weekend. Here's our application over here. Normally, there's something that's going to connect us, and this is what I'm talking about today. So we have the database management system, and then we have the database or the storage that's related to the Oracle database management system that we're considering. And uh, we also have this hierarchy sort of in place as well. So this is a single database. How many people out there, you know, actually just use one database? Well, if you're doing application development, the question is going to you. Whether or not you just use one database for your source of data, not normally. As an example, your Barnes & Noble or your Amazon or your, um, you know, a bookseller or a retail store, you have many different suppliers, many different product sources, many different databases. And then you're using something more along the lines of this. Anybody not sign the attendance yet? Everybody in this room has signed the attendance. Okay, good. Thank you. Or not signed. Had it checked, I should say. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> All right, so uh, here's the architecture looking at one application that's connecting to three different databases as an example. They could be all Oracle databases, they could be one Oracle, a couple of Informix, one MySQL. It doesn't necessarily all have to be the same. And here's our standard kind of way of doing it. 
we have the driver manager. So we have the application with the driver manager, then we have a driver. This is where the JDBC, the ODBC, all of the different driver interfaces um, participate in this program here. We have driver one, driver two, driver three. So you can write one application, let's say write it in Java, and then have many different managers, uh, the driver managers for your database that are instances of these driver managers that are created. Each one of the driver manager is taking care of the access to whatever database it's responsible for. So we can divide it out and make it more, uh, you know, make it essentially uh, support as many databases as we have to connect to, which, you know, then we can pull inventory from multiple different sources and say, here's the book and it's available from this company and this company and this company and this company. And kind of do an aggregate if we wanted to among many different database sources. So here's the overall architecture. Hopefully you can see that there. Yeah. So we have the application up here. Now we have a class one, class two. Think of them as objects. Class implementation number one, class implementation number two. Uh, where we're going to connect through, and this is using the ODBC on a standalone computer where we've got a data manager who's keeping track of data source one, data source two, data source three that's associated with the data driver or data driver type, which might be JDBC, might be ODBC, might be made by different third party manufacturers. So this is what the overall big picture looks like for what I'm going to be describing in terms of the examples and in terms of the technologies that apply towards this. This is the arc, you know, this is the basic architecture you're going to be developing if you actually are working with a database with an application. So, so let's do some vocabulary. ODBC still being used. It's the standard interface for which application programs can access and process SQL databases. In a database management system independent manner, you load on an ODBC driver, it usually comes with the operating system. When it comes by default, it comes with Windows, actually. Windows has an ODBC manager. If you go to the control panel, normally you'll see it. Um, so it contains a data source, which is the database itself, that's associated with the operating system and the network platform. Maybe the data source is uh, through an IP address, not necessarily you know, a DB, uh, an MDB file. Because these basically, ODBC works with Microsoft databases, MySQL, SQL, Oracle, you name it, works with it. And if you're looking at, let's say, third-party reporting tool, like Crystal Reports or something, they go through ODBC interfaces to connect. So it's pretty much the standard driver interface to the database. And uh, we have the driver itself that's supplied by the vendor might be Oracle, might be an independent software company. The vendors like to make the drivers because they know, usually they know the interface better than everybody else, but not always. And then we have the driver manager, which is supplied by the vendor, sometimes by the operating system as well. Windows does its own. Actually, the Mac OS X does, has their own database manager interface as well. If you go into the control panel, administrative tools, this is kind of old, this is for an XP version. Data sources. In Windows, what you're going to end up with is an, uh, you can use the ODBC, access, ODBC to access Microsoft Access or Excel documents or even other things too. So generally we think of it in terms of database connectivity, but it can actually connect to Microsoft Office products, um, which is kind of interesting because you can load in. You can use ODBC and database connectivity to load in anything on a Microsoft system. So you can load in a Word file, an Excel file. PowerPoint file into your application through this, through the same object interface, which is kind of interesting. And that's how you can embed different Office products inside of different things, which makes for an interesting implementation, actually. Very feature rich. So the interface itself is system independent. So it requires the driver to provide for the database system. And the driver bridges the differences or the gaps between the ODBC and the database dependent characteristics. So the driver is really the interface that does the work in terms of the um, translation of all of the different proprietary commands from one system to another. So here we have our ODBC standard API that works between the application and the driver manager. And we have the Oracle driver DB2 which is another database, SQL server another database. <coughs> and we have the interface from the drivers to the databases themselves. Uh, through the ODBC interface. So the Java support 
which is where I'm getting to actually. Uh, so instead of calling it ODBC, which stands for ob object, object database, the J is replaced with for Java database. So Java database connectivity is what we're looking at here. Um, makes it a lot easier actually, and it's more cross-platform compatible. ODBC works well with Windows and works well with my Mac OS X, but you can't use one language to program in it for both platforms. And the drivers themselves are platform specific. So one set works with Windows, one set of the ODBCs works with Mac OS X. So Java came around, obviously cross-platform compatible, made it so that the drivers work everywhere. So you ship the product with one set of drivers. <laughs> and those drivers work with all of the databases on all of the different platforms. So that's why a lot of people are taking this route. It's um, easier and more uniform, and it's a general package solution without having to create a different program for every single app platform, essentially. So when an application is written in Java, you want to access data sources. Uh, because 99.9, well, 99.999% of all applications out there use a database, and most of them are running on the internet these days. So you're probably going to run into this. Um, so the classes are associated with methods that are associated with the JDBC API. So the JDBC is, um, specifies an interface or a connection between the application and the uh, database. So it provides a convenient way to realize many different drivers together. <coughs> so it's an interface to an ODBC driver as well. It could actually communicate with the ODBC manager through any operating system. So it's very useful, and there's not too many commands. There's like maybe seven different steps to create a JDBC application. So it provides JDP API a strong way to connect common relational databases. So here's where it fits into the hierarchy. <coughs> the application is written in Java. Then we have the API standard that takes us. And so instead of using ODBC, just replace it with the JDBC drivers. So it's, the architecture is pretty much the same. You're substituting JDBC for ODBC in a particular case. And here's where the JDBC API is going to connect between the application and the Oracle data driver. So we have Java support for SQL that's written in here. So we have embedded SQL in Java. So you load a package, java.sql. <laughs> then we can use SQL date types, time, fields that are similar to data types that are found in SQL. We can run queries, have a query statement, execute a query, do all sorts of different things in automation with Java written in Java programming language. So you're kind of taking, and this is why I kind of mentioned PLSQL, and I thought about that when I started this lecture. In the JDBC approach with Java, you're starting with a traditional style programming language, and you're writing SQL commands in there, and you're using an interface to SQL in languages like PLSQL, you're writing SQL code, and you're using SQL as if it were the programming language, and you're putting that in a scripting language. And so it's a slightly different kind of interface, but in essence, it's very similar in concept to what we're accomplishing here. So, uh, so that's your other choice. If you're not taking the Java route, you can do the PLSQL. The only problem with PLSQL is it server side runs on the server. You can't write a client side application with it. Well, you can't write a client-side application with Java either unless you put it into an applet. Nobody in the world is going to stick proprietary uh, database login information in an applet. So you're going to be creating a server-side program for this as well. So Java supported embedded SQL. <coughs> so there's a package that you can import. So you embedded SQL allowing... Connectivity to databases, including SQL code, right in the program itself without having to exit out of the program, run SQL, get that result, parse it back into the program. So what we're trying to do here is an overall objective or motivation is integrate both together, both worlds together. So, so it converts the SQL commands to Java code at a pre-compiled time um, state in the pre-compiled generated code that includes driver functionality for direct connection to the database via the JDBC driver. So here it is here, the java.sql package and the extension exceptions for uh, the hierarchy. So what does that mean? Well, when you run the Java command here using the java.sql package, it'll actually come back and give you the error messages. So people will fight, you know, they go, I don't want to use this technique. I want to, like, you know, I want to do this without having to use anything. I don't know anything. I just know how to program in Java. 
And then you end up doing twice as much work because you run the command, and then maybe the command fails. Who knows? You're not going to know it. The program's not going to know it. And then you come back and you continue the programming, assuming that the command worked. And then you have inconsistent data in your database because you've updated something, and the customer thinks that they're going to receive something, but your shopping cart program is broken because the database was down when the update occurred, so the shipping information never got recorded. Update didn't work. But the application doesn't know that. So people take this route because now the application can know that. You get the Oracle exceptions that come back or the MySQL exceptions that come back and say, hey, a uh, person's already in the database. Oh, and then you can use that for your error checking in your Java code to say, you know, do you want a new customer account or would you like to use the current information that we have? Because there's more integration with the application and the database. So, so the data source and the drivers, <coughs> in fact, these links probably still work. In fact, I know this one does. If you go to the links, you don't actually have to do anything for any of the assignments in this course, but if you take the Java EE class, you'll integrate uh, JDBC as one of the assignments, actually. Uh, but this is the Oracle class. But, uh, so the data source is the database that's being created or using any common database applications themselves. Your system should have the driver for the database, so you download the driver. For MySQL, as an example, on a Windows system, there are a number of drivers available, and these are just some examples, actually. You can go to the links if you want to and explore the different drivers that are available. The installation is pretty easy. You just download it, drag it, put it into your package uh, folder, your, something that's in your class path. So that, and it's a JAR file, so it's a .jar, J-A-R file that you're loading that's going to essentially provide you with the database connectivity. <coughs> so. What is this database connectivity? Here are the components. So, and this is the standard architecture for all of the different versions. This is not any particular version specific. Um, this is for everything. So we have the driver manager, loads the database drivers, makes the connection between the application and the driver. And then we have the driver, which translates the API calls to the operations for the specific data source. So if I said, you know, select star, the driver is going to say, what is that in Oracle? It's select star. <laughs> what is that in MySQL? It's going to be the same. But, oh, it's a query. So treat it like a query. Run the query. So it's going to know how to run the query. In the old days, when we did this through CGI or something, you wrote all of the database stuff yourself. You said, you know, connect to the database, do this, do this, do this. Now it's establish a connection, then send the connection, this information, over and over again. So it's more efficient, actually, as well. Because in the older days, without using JDBC as an example, you, uh, each client who came through with each internet connection had its own dedicated connection to the database. Granted, through one, probably not an admin account, but one internet low security account, I mean, high security, low access account that allowed it just to query or something. Um, so you set the privileges on an internet login, and then you had a connection for each one of the people who logged into it. And then sometimes you had multiple connections from each one of the people who logged into it. And then Java EE came around and said, well, if you put it on the server side, you can use RMI, remote method invocation, to make an instance of each one of those database connectivity objects on the server. Once a connection exists, new clients who come in can use that existing connection. And then we don't have a new connection for every single user who's logged in. We only have one. So it makes it more efficient on the server. And then on the client side, using JDBC within the application side, then you can go, well, instead of having like five different connections, you connect once, and you keep going through that same object. So you make it more efficient on the client side as well. You put both of them together, then you have Java EE with JDBC for uh, enterprise-wide application development, which is a lot more efficient. So this is one of the components of it. Um, so don't think that this is everything. We have the server end of it that we can optimize as well. So for the connection, that's the session between the application and the driver and the statements, there's the SQL statements to perform the query or an update a program or something. And then we have the metadata, which is the information about the data that's returned. So we have how many rows were returned, what are these rows, what data type uh, is this data inside each one of these com uh, com columns. And then we have the result set, which is a logical set of columns and rows that are returned by executing a statement. So in terms of the classes, supports database facility facilities by providing classes and interface for its components. So the driver manager class 
the connection interface, which is an abstract class, and these are all classes. So if you're not familiar with Java, think of them as, or if you're familiar with C++, it's the same concept. They're object classes. So in Java, they have a dot, uh, Java or dot class if you compile it extension. Or these are classes that you're going to create in C++ and then use these classes inside of the main driver program or your application. So we have abstract classes for the connection because we're probably not going to implement a, you know, the connection's not going to be the same for every single object instance that we're going to create. So we're going to use it in terms of inheritance to create a base connection interface and then customize the interface to each one of the databases if we want to. And then a statement interface to, to be instantiated with the values of the actual SQL statement that are received. And then we have the result set interface that gives us the what we have received back from. And this is standard kind of vocabulary that you'll get in all JDBC and ODBC kind of classes. So, so java.sql is implemented via the classes in the java.sql package. So here's the package information for SQL. Supports SQL2 entry level. Well, it's the beginning SQL. Some of the PL or some of the SQL plus Oracle commands not supported. So sometimes you'll use something like describe or, you know, one of these one of these SQL plus commands that works with SQL window command interface for Oracle won't necessarily work with the Java SQL package. Only because it's not supported, only the standard interface is supported, which is kind of interesting, actually. Uh, because then if they were not to support, you know, if they were to just like, say, let's extend this to everything, you know how hard that would be to be compatible with all SQL versions out there? <laughs> when all SQL versions are supposed to be compliant, so, but they're not, because every database has different commands that are part of that particular environment that aren't part of other environments. Just consider all the joins. Some languages support the word join, some don't. Some do natural join, left join, right join, outer joins, inner joins, and the words are actually supported inside of the SQL interface. Some don't. <laughs> so you can't support everything and know which database you're connected to and then consider that one and support it. So instead they decided, well, let's back it up basic just stuff that's supported by everybody in standard SQL2 entry level, which is the base system without any of the extra stuff. So define objects for remote connectivities to database for executing a query. We have eight different interfaces to uh, define objects. And here are the interfaces. Statement, callable statement, prepared statement, database metadata, meta set metadata, get metadata, uh, result sets connectivity or connection, and then the driver itself. So here's our seven steps. First, we have to create an instance of a driver manager. Once we create the driver manager, then we know that we're going to be using a database. And we load the driver. And then we define the connection URL. Because what we're doing is building an enterprise-wide. We have a database server out there. We don't normally run the application on the server. The user is going to run the application on their computer or it's going to be run from an application server. An application server is going to connect to the database server. Those companies who put everything on one computer, <laughs> one server, are usually startup companies or small companies. Or they're companies that are sharing server space with other companies or renting server space, which makes sense to put it all on the same system. But even if you're using an outsource system, uh, outsource server space, they have dedicated database servers because you need that. Because databases grow, they take up memory, they um, have tons of connections to them, and you're going to bog down the main server, and your whole system is going to go down if the database crashes, essentially, and databases crash all the time. So, more so than the application server. So, in essence, you want to put it on a dedicated server. And if you're doing that, you're going to need to connect to that server, which is why you're going to be using the driver manager. Because somewhere in your application, you have, where's that server? Here's the IP address. Okay. Establish a connection. Load the driver. Define the connection URL. Establish the connection. Once you have that done, you create, a, you create a statement object to say, hey, I need to send something to the database, which is my statement. It might be a connection statement, but not really because we've already established a connection. So instead, it's probably going to be something like select star from employees where first name is equal to such and such. And then you're going to have the query execute. 
And then you're going to process the results that are going to come back. And then you're going to close the connection, which is basically the seven steps I'm going to go through to kind of show you. This is kind of the de facto standard in terms of connecting to databases through Internet applications. So, Loading the driver. Registering the driver directly or automatically. Well, it's class.forname org.oracle.driver. One statement does it all for everything, essentially. And then you call the name, uh, which is automatically called uh, when the program starts up. Creates an instance of the driver. And then registers the driver with the driver manager. So it's kind of an easy concept. And then identifying the data sources gives, uh, so give the required information for making the connection to the database. So you need the data source. So you specify the URL format. So you've got, here's some examples here. So JDBC Oracle, this doesn't exist actually, um, but if we had a server, uh, we had a name on a server or local host for a test database as an example. So you give it the URL of the database, which is how you can actually house your application on your server, outsource your database to another company, have another company manage the server. Why does it have to be even at the same location? Which if you're a huge company, it's not going to be at the same location because what happens if we have a storm like we have right now on the East Coast? So they're losing power. Well, then if you're on the West Coast <laughs> then and you're Wells Fargo Bank or something like that, you're not going to have any customer support. You're not going to have anybody able to do anything at your bank. So you're not going to necessarily house it over there. Instead, you're going to house it in California or you're going to house it in some other state that's not so... I mean, we just have earthquakes over here. We don't normally have you know, huge old tornadoes or anything like that. Uh, that are going to essentially wipe out anything or shut any power off or anything. We have predictable weather. We just have earthquakes over here. So, Long story short, earthquakes uh, rarely happen, but when they do, they're pretty devastating. But uh, uh, You're going to put your servers in multiple states and multiple locations. If you're Google, you're going to put them all over the place so that when a user logs in, they're going to log into one that's up and running, hopefully. So. So another option might be to create an instance of the driver and then register it with the driver manager before you actually set the connection do it at the beginning. So you say driver, driver is equal to driver uh, class dot for name and this is going to be an Oracle driver and make a, some, a new instance essentially. And these are basic methods that are being called on the driver instances that are being created that in this particular case is going to be assigned to a driver object. If you're not familiar with the Java um, syntax, don't worry about it. Um, eventually, hopefully, you'll take a Java course because you can't really be working in software development without knowing something about Java these days because Java is used a lot, especially with databases. Uh, so driver manager dot register driver driver registers it. So we're running a method register driver, we're sending the method a parameter driver, which is the driver object which is the driver, uh, think of it sort of like a library that's downloaded and installed. And we're sending that, we're s telling the driver manager, here's the driver we're using and here's the object that we're connecting to and here it is. And so let the driver manager do that. So if you want something, you just run a method on the driver manager. And then it's all integrated into an object-oriented fashion. So for the connection, the connection represents the session with the specific database that you're looking at. Not to be confused with the concept of a session in internet development, it is similar but not the same. It's not stored in a connection uh, file or a session cookie or a piece of data or something like that. Instead, it's actually stored on the server and also stored on the client. So within the application, the object is managing the session for you. So you're not writing anything to the client's computer. No session data, no cookies, nothing like that, uh, which is nice because then the client can't mess it up. If the client can't do anything with it, the browser is not going to complain about anything. It's stored in a, you know, an application it's running. Which is another interesting point because you can put this in a non-internet application but it still works as an internet application. So it's not running through your web browser. You're writing a regular old Java application. You load it up. The application is connecting to the database via the connection object, not using a web browser. So, which is nice, actually, because then you're really building an enterprise-wide application at that point, or a distributed system. So, within the context of the connection, the SQL statements are executed, and the results are returned, and so our connections, they're building on the concept that there could be multiple connections in a database. Usually there is. 
It actually provides the metadata or the information about the database, the tables, the fields, and the object, uh, connection object that has methods to deal with transactions. And uh, if you take the EE course, um, I go into Java transaction um, authorities and Java transaction um, concepts that are more of a transaction management concept for distributed computing. Uh, and the JDBC works with it. There's a transaction manager for the driver that will communicate with other transaction managers to make that happen. So, in terms of creating the connection, you can use the uh, get connection on the driver to get the URL, the password, the username, connects to the database. Put the given name and password, throws a Java SQL, SQL exception exception. So it returns the connection object from the exception, which is interesting because now you can get SQL exceptions. So you can get that aura 1.1.5. whatever connection error and work with it. And you still have to go look it up, but you still get the connection error though. So creating the connection, here's the sample code for creating a connection. Connection space connection. So we're creating a new connection. It's going to be equal to the driver manager dot get connection using this driver at this internet address, username, password. So lo and behold, we have the concept of statements. So if we create a driver interface for the statements, we have a statement that is an example create statement. Create statement returns a new statement object used for general queries that you might be running. Prepared statement and callable statements. So a prepare statement returns a new prepared statement object for the statement uh, called with multiple times with different values pre-compiled to reduce parsing time. Uh, so a prepare statement is another easy way. So going back to what I was talking about in terms of not taking this route, doing things the CGI approach, or doing things no OG, ODBC, well ODBC, but no JDBC kind of connection. You send a query to the database because the customer logged into your website or logged in your application is now searching for books with this title. And uh, it sends a query to the database server. That's your bottleneck, is your connectivity. So you want to reduce the amount of connectivity, the amount of queries you're actually sending to the database. So prepare statement allows you to prepare it ahead of time send the statement to the database. Now instead of resending the same statement over and over and over again, you just send the parameters. And so now the customer wants to look at this author. Okay, statement's the same. Don't have to go transport that again. Just send the new author's name. The new author's name gets sent. So you're reducing the amount of network traffic between your application and the server, and it's making it more efficient. And you're letting the server cache the query, prepare it ahead of time, and then you're just running it, makes it faster as well. Because now you don't have to go, okay, database, open up, establish a connection, run the query, send me the results, close the connection, and then five minutes later, okay, database, establish a connection, run the query. That's too slow. You can't, you can't have the user sit there and go, you know, waiting, waiting, I'm running your query now. The user wants results now. So if you prepare a statement, send it over there, use a technique like this, you can develop an interactive user interface to the database where you're sending and you're connecting to a remote database. But it looks like this stuff is right here in the application. It's instant. You just say, and how, I mean, how many times have you gone to Barnes & Noble or you've gone to Amazon or, and stuff comes back instantly? It's doing a database connection. It's either using JDBC or a similar technology where it's actually going out and connecting to another server and doing a query and caching the results and populating the result sets back into the form instantly. So if you want to compete with that, you got to use the same technologies. If you use older technology, not going to work. It's going to be too slow. In fact, you can see it in older technologies, especially really old shopping carts. It's just there waiting, updating, authorizing. You know, they put all these words in here, you know, because of, User's not going to sit there and go, what's going on now? You know, hourglass, you know. Actually, Apple's funny. They put in the little spinning wheel. It's like, oh, stuff's going on. Oh, no, actually, you're connecting to a database <laughs> is what's going on. Or something's going on there, you know. So uh, we users don't want to see that. They just want it to happen, you know. Hey, order's placed. Okay, no problem. I'll continue. All right, so then that's a preparable statement, actually, and helps that streamlines the process. So callable statements return a new callable statement object for stored procedures and things. So 
So a statement object is used to execute a static SQL statement that obtains the results produced by it. Then we have a execute query and execute update. So if we take the commands and break them out into a couple of different categories, then we can streamline the processing. Older driver packages said a command as a command and didn't pay attention to it, just sent, you know, send a command, send another command, send another command. So see, now we can divide it out into a couple of different categories, and then if we're not going to accept the result back, we're just running a command that's doing an update, then we can get a yes, pass, successful, or a no, failed response back, and not wait for a query, not wait for a result set. But if we want data back, then we can execute something where we're going to actually get a result set back and then prepare to handle the result when it does come back and not sit there and wait for it. Because some databases, actually what ends up happening is the uh, query will take five minutes. It's easier not going to sit there for five minutes. You want your application to still work while the query is going on. So some of it's planning the application design when the connectivity occurs. And then also as well as optimizing the type of statement that you're running. So JDBC breaks it out into an execute query or an execute update statement. It allows you to either wait for results or don't wait for the results and get some status that comes back. So in terms of executing queries and updates, the result set execute query with a string executes a query statement that returns a single result set. Here we have integer execute update string where we're going to say, well, okay, so execute an SQL insert update or a delete statement. So we can essentially um, update something on the database with a string, and the string is going to be the SQL statement that we're sending the update command. It creates a drop a table, create a table, um, returns the number of rows changed, perhaps. So, In fact, you, there's a many different, in fact, uh, here's an interesting example for you to consider. So for some people who don't want to, like, you know, connect to a server, <coughs> use an SQL plus window. There's a ton of these little applications that are out there that are all written in Java. And the applications are interfaces to your database. There's like a ton of them out there. You, know, you just put in your database URL, and you put in your username and your password, and then you can graphically drag and drop stuff and create tables and configure your database. That program, those programs are just doing this. <laughs> they're executing statements. They're Basically, you could write your own program in Java to create your own interface to the database. So rather than giving the user tools to create an update, you're giving them tools to, I don't know, populate the database or search the database or do something with it as well. So those tools are just written in this fashion. They're just using drivers to interface to the database. So um, a very popular one they're written in PHP is the PHP admin or my PHP admin. Very popular open source, and people use it all the time for MySQL. It's a PHP script. <laughs> it's using, it's not even using this, it's not even using, because it's not written in Java, it's PHP. It's just using basic PHP commands to query the database, update the database, provide a little user interface to the database. Makes it a little easier, because people don't like looking at a flashing cursor. So that's all PHP admin's doing. So, which is kind of interesting because every every web server usually gives you access to a PHP admin install, which is a nice little PHP script actually. It's not too bad. It's very popular. So the operation is not completed in the given time. We have an SQ exception that is thrown. What's that good for? User interface design. So in the old days, you used to like you know put in something. You know you went to wellsfargo.com or something. Actually, maybe I shouldn't say Wells Fargo. You went to thegreatbank.com <laughs> and uh, you said, uh, give me my account information. Waiting, 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 waiting. And then you went and you left the website or you left the program, you closed the program down and you opened it back up again and established another connection to the database and it said waiting. Wait. You do that five or six times. It's like, you know, have you ever called into support to a company? I'm sorry, but there's 99 people on hold ahead of you. No, 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 that's just me. I called in 99 times. I, I kept hanging up and calling back and hanging up and calling back. And then eventually the person on the phone you know, goes, oh, I'm just going to lunch. I have way too many people waiting to, to, to talk to me, and, and I don't want to deal with that right now. So long story short, you, uh, you can design the user interface so that doesn't happen. So you don't have the situation in which the person is going to drop. Instead, the database can just drop automatically. So if the person on hold could take a look and say, well, what if uh, I'm going to 
pre-populate the slide while I'm talking. What if people uh, didn't have the option of hanging up? What if we just hung them up? So you can put a timeout in the driver that says after you know two seconds or whatever you think is reasonable, it'll come back and say, I'm sorry, the database is down right now. Can you please try again later? Which is what your ATMs are doing. So your ATM is going to tell you ahead of time when you walk up to it. It's going to say, hey, we don't have paper <laughs> or... I, don't, I can't give you a receipt. I can't do deposits for you. I can't do withdrawals for you. Um, or there's no connectivity right now. Go away. <laughs> kind of thing. So the user doesn't try it. So you can use the timeouts. And you can use the exceptions to create a better user interface. Long story short. We also have cursors. I talked about cursors, but this is several weeks ago. Last time we had Oracle class. And the cursor concept is the temporary information that is being stored on the database after you run a query. That stuff comes back and gets put into a result set, gets taken from the cursor. So what's the result of a query? Well, that's the cursor. So the result of the query is kept in what's called the cursor. How can a database send the results of the query through communication lines? Well, it can use the cursor. So JDBC actually just sends you the cursor. Other programs, other interfaces will manipulate the cursor. You don't get the whole thing. So you're wondering, well, why do I want the whole thing? I want to know what Oracle gave me, not what somebody else is giving me. So if you get what the Oracle system or the MySQL system or whatever, it's the same concept with all these databases. If you get the cursor, you get what the database came back with, identical to the way it came back. And if you have a program that has a driver manager that can work with the cursor directly, you get everything, not just some interpretation. It's almost like, you know, I heard the message through five different people, and the message changed, you know? And then, uh, or isn't it better to just hear the message once from the original source and actually get the real information? <laughs> Which is what you're doing when you talk to the cursor. So the result set is nothing more than a product of the cursor. It's the cursor being sent back. If you do that, then you know exactly what format each one of the columns was in, what data actually came back, not a translated version of the data. So there are still applications out there that are working with translated data. You know, the stuff comes back, and it was a number, but it was converted to a string, and then it was converted back to a number, and now it's missing decimal places. <laughs> or it suffered from rounding errors from all the data conversion it, it underwent. It's not quite as reliable as actually working with the real data that came out of that query, which is going to be in the result set that's going to come back. So the cursor is the result set. Result set is the cursor. Yeah? yeah uh, so is it something like cached? Think of it like a variable. <laughs> it's cached information. So if, I, if, I, if I'm on a database and I say, hey, uh, select star from this table where everybody is equal to this. I get something back. So the Oracle engine produces this result for me. It's called the cursor. The result is the data that's coming back out in the format that Oracle put it in. What gets printed to the screen is the cursor results. So it'll say, if it was a select star, it'll say, okay, five rows created. Whatever gets printed on the screen is what the SQL window or the web interface is programmed to display to you. You don't get all the cursor information out of that. What you're getting is what you're supposed to get from the interface that you're working with. Some interfaces actually give you better results than others. Sometimes, let's say, for example, you do an update, it'll come back and say, five rows updated. Sometimes you go log well, in and it says, okay, five rows updated, row number one, row number two, row number three, and gives you all the row information. All that stuff's coming from the cursor, but some interfaces are going to give you more or less data that comes out of it. What primitive applications did was took whatever appeared on the screen and sent that as a result set. Five rows updated. Great. What were the rows? <laughs> what was updated? I want that stuff. So if you're just sending back five rows updated and not the real cursor, if I get the real cursor, then I can go, well, what were those rows? I can ask the cursor and I can pull my own information out of the cursor. On the database, yes. Actually, you can access the cursor from the Oracle My, uh, from, from the Oracle SQL Plus command line window. You can also configure the output. As an example, you can actually customize your interface. You're not going to do this unless you're a DBA, probably, but so that 
like stuff doesn't appear, error messages don't appear, uh, the result sets are formatted differently, um, which is what you're doing is you're modifying the cursor output. So it reads it from the cursor, think, see the cursor like a temporary variable, holding the information that's coming out out of the result. It's the result set. And uh, so you can modify the interface, it takes a little bit of programming. You can use PLSQL actually to do it, and you can actually read the cursor. Load the cursor, go through the cursor, see what's in the cursor, see what's in there, go through all the different rows uh, in the results, and it's just temporary information. So it's the output that that database gave you. So not necessarily what you're seeing, you're not necessarily seeing all of that. Otherwise, it'd be like way too much information for most people. They just want to know five rows updated, or comes back and says, good, bad, or usually successful, failed, query successful. Actually, if you look at Microsoft Access, there's nothing. You just get nothing. It just comes back. There's no line. There's no... In Oracle, they used to say, you know, five rows updated successfully at this time on this date. All this time. Because this cursor's keeping track of the time, the date, the number of rows, what was changed in each row, what the data types were for the rows. All this stuff the user never sees, actually. So if you can use PLSQL... Take the cursor, copy it to a variable, traverse through the cursor, pull the information out. You can actually write a better interface, actually, a better SQL interface, so that you can actually see exactly what's going on with that. So a lot of people take that route because they're just not happy with the regular results they get out of the, the output. In fact, I, I, I seriously hate the output because you get, like, you know, Aura Air 5952. What in the world is that? So, so now, actually, they've changed it now, so you can, it puts in here, you know, missing something, or something unknown, or, you know, like, two words or so of explanation that goes along with it, but still it's not enough. But, you know, if they put a whole paragraph on there, then they wouldn't be able to sell you any documentation. <laughs> not to say that they're in the business of selling documentation, but that stuff's expensive. Although, you can look on the Internet and get that stuff free on the Internet, but it's hard to go through it. It's like you're looking at the man pages for a Unix server. Not so good. All right, back to result set. So it provides the access to the table of the data generated by executing a statement. So it's actually in a form of a table that comes back that gives you, you know, instead of just seeing the table, you can actually get to the table data. Only one result set per statement can be uh, opened at once. And the table rows are retrieved in sequence. And the result set maintains a cursor pointing to its current row of the data. And so we can remove, in fact, when you run the query on uh, an SQL plus window and you turn off the logging and you turn off, uh, uh, you put on auto commit, your cursor goes away. <laughs> Every time you run a new command, the cursor gets reset. Because why are we logging anything? We don't need to log anything. And we're auto committing. We don't have to backtrack anything. So if you turn on, turn off auto commit, the cursor stays around until you commit. So some of that information is in the cursor. So you're going to be able to roll back. You're going to be able to modify what you've done and step, go step back through and troubleshoot easier if you have that stuff saved. But a lot of people want speed. So if you know you're going to commit it and you know you're not going to need it, turn off the logging, turn off the put on auto commit. The system will run a lot faster because cursor gets cached. The cursor gets refreshed with each new curse with each new database query instead of being stacked up. So a stack structure is used for the cursor, so you can put results, 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 results. So you can go back, 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 <laughs> undo the cursor, essentially, which is how the rollback is working. It's cursor implemented for the most part and logged. So if you put on system logging as another example. Uh, and this is one, in one of the supplemental Oracle lectures. Every time someone logs in, every time someone does anything, all the cursor information is stored in the log, all of the user activity is stored in logs, depending upon what logs you have turned on. So you can see, oh, employee B hacker came in and deleted all of the student records. Oh, man, we're going to fire her, you know, <laughs> and then you can figure out who did what. You know, oh, she did this on the night of October 31st or something. You know. Oh, you know, then you can kind of you know use it as a basis for seeing who did what. 
All right, so back to results. So, so the table uh, rows are retrieved in sequence and maintains cursor pointing to the next row. So we have next. So the next method moves the cursor to the next row. You can't rewind when you've used next because next is actually going to take and remove stuff from the cursor. Um, you can keep it by using other techniques. But uh, So in terms of working with the result sets, we have methods that we can run. As an example, next, close, open. So we're caching the result set on our local computer, our client side. We're traversing through the cursor information that's basically the result set. And we're going to see what's in there. And we're going to put it, populated on a screen. Or we're going to do something with it, which is why we're working with it that way. So activates the next, activates the next row. So the first call to next ex activates the first row. And so it returns false if there's no more rows left, because it's going to remove the rows. So it goes through row by row. Close, disposes of the result set. Doesn't remove the cursor from the database. Removes it from the local system. So if you have a problem, you can always go back to the database, retrieve the cached result set from the JDBC manager, which is also going to keep track of that for you, which you won't get if you just make a standard connection. Once the connection is lost, oh, so does the data that's associated with the session. But if the connection is not lost because you have a manager keeping track of it through the JDBC system, then uh, that stuff can be cached. And you can say, well, what was that result set again? And not have to run the query again. You just go back and re-get the go back and retry and get the results set back. Because what happens if you never receive the results? Which is another interesting <coughs> problem that happens in database kind of connectivity issues. So if you don't get it, just ask for it again and you can get it. So getting values from rows. So you can type a, a get type for a data type. Get a data type. So you can go integer column index returns the given field at a given type. So examples here, integer, get int 5, the fifth row or the fifth uh, item as an integer. So you're going to get an integer. The data type is going to be an int. String get string 3. So fields index starting with w at 1, not 0. So, which is kind of interesting because programmers are used to arrays and things starting with 0. Yeah. But the result set actually starts with one, which is inconsistent. So the one, two, three. Because database people don't talk in zeros, they talk in counting numbers. So which is kind of weird. So type get type or a string gets you a string. So same uses the name of the field. Less efficient because now we have to look up the name of the field instead of going through the index. So the result set is indexed like the cursor. So if we use the numbers for each one of the indexed items. It's a faster lookup because we just say, give me five, give me four, give me three, give me two. <laughs> Instead of, give me first name. And let's go, where is first name? So if we're using the index of the cursor, we're going to definitely get faster results. And a find column looks up the index given a column name. So. And then we have the is null. Where do you get that in other programming languages? No, you don't get that as part of the date. The Java SQL package is going to say, recognize this concept of nulls. As I remember before, we have that, that unknown as well. It recognizes unknowns for the, no, it's not true, no, it's not false, it's unknown, for the three degree logic. So it is null. So in SQL, null means that the field is empty. Not the same as zero or empty, it's null. So if we use a JDBC manager, we can actually come back and say, hey, it's null, which means it really is null. So in JDBC, you must explicitly ask if the field is null by calling the result set that is null column. If it's null, that means the person's probably not in there. The result came back unknown or null. So we don't know if we should add that person again. So mapping Java data types to SQL types. So as I mentioned before, you can use Java SQL at the bottom of the slide here, dot date, dot time, dot timestamp. The dot SQL, the SQL package gives you the SQL data types. So instead of using integer, float, double, all the other things that you might be associated with in terms of regular old programming data types, the dot SQL is going to give you the data types that are associated with the SQL language, standard language, by the way. So non-standard SQL data types, not part of this. So it's just a standard base. So character, variable character, yes, we have a variable character data type. 
it turns into a string over here, a math, big decimal, boolean. So there's a mapping. In PLSQL, you get the identical data types, no mapping. So a lot of people like PLSQL because then you don't have to convert it. If you're working with a banking program, anything with money, anything with translation, there's always the mystery of the conversion. Is the conversion rounding? Is the conversion identical? Are we truncating anything? And then uh, what ends up happening is you have that one small mistake, it's off by a penny. But for a million pennies, <laughs> it's a significant dollar amount. <laughs> so not such a good idea, which is why people like PLSQL for financial. And then there's Oracle financial packages that use PL in there inside of the theory because it's dollar per dollar, penny per penny. It's an identical data type, and it's the same data type. There's no conversion. So most people learn that when they start using programming languages and they convert from a float to an integer and then they add it with another integer and they, you know, they do all these conversions and then they discover, oh wait a minute, the number's wrong. Yeah, you can't be wrong. So database time. So times in SQL are non-standard. So Java defines three different classes to help you with the times. There's the date, which is the year, month, year, month, day. There's a time, hours, minutes, and seconds. And then there's the time stamp. So year, month, day, hour, minutes, and seconds, or nanoseconds. So most time you're going to use a timestamp. So, and then we have the optimized statements for the prepare. So prepare statements, SQL calls uh, calls that you make again and again, over and over again, and you're making these so that you can automate uh, this the process. It allows the driver to optimize um, compile ser uh, queries on the server, as I mentioned before created with the connection prepare statement method. And then we have stored procedures are written in database specific languages, stored inside the database, accessible through the prepared call, or prepared statements. So those would be the optimized statements category. So here's our prepared statement example. Where we have a prepared statement update sales, and then update string is going to be equal to update coffee. Set sales, and then we see these question marks in here. So this is an example of how you would do this. So you take and create one SQL statement, send it to the database, call it a prepared statement using a prepared statement object, and then just keep it sending it new sales numbers or new authors' last names or new ISBNs for that matter. And then you don't have to keep resending the query. It doesn't have to rerun the query. It takes the cursor that's created from the prepared statement and just gives you the new ISBNs or just gives you the new or updates, runs the query on the server end to update with the coffee sales or update with. So you're just sending the parameters, long story short. If you just send the parameters, less traffic, fewer problems, queries reliable to the most part, and uh, you know it's more efficient and less waiting on the user end. So here's an example here of sending it. The first parameter is one, the last one's going to be uh, from an array of uh, sales for the week for I for the first sales of the week. And then here an update, another one set of string two to coffees. So update with a coffee name. So the value of the prepared statement uh, allows you to automate the process. So here's the big picture of all the minor little details put together. What we have over here starting this is actually kind of running from right to left instead of left to right. But uh, yours is yeah yours is still the same right to left <laughs> to turn around look at the screen. Uh, so the driver manager over here is going to get a connection with a connection object. The connection object here is going to have some commands associated with it, commit, abort. Actually, you can set an auto commit on the connection object. Not such a good idea, especially if you lose the connection and you're halfway in the middle of a transaction. Auto commit, oh yeah, sure. Withdraw from one account and deposit into another. Okay, we did the withdrawal. Well, oh, bad connection, sorry. No deposit. <laughs> so then you're stuck. Uh, so anyway, you're not going to do that. In fact, you're going to do the commit at the end after you've checked the results of everything out, and then you're going to roll back, hopefully, if you have a nice transaction management plan going on. So create statement, a prepared statement, a callable statement. Depending upon the type of statement that you're sending, you're going to have a different kind of process that the statement's going to go in uh, that's going to be processed per the type of statement. So on a create statement, it's just a simple statement, executes a query, get more results from a result set comes back, and then the result set can be used. 
on a prepared statement, you can send it over and over and over again. And just basically continue to execute the statement with different parameters. And then we have the callable statement. And these are all subclasses, so there's a hierarchy of all of the different types of statements that can be made. So if we optimize the types of statements, then essentially we can optimize the efficiency of how the statements are being executed, which is the theory. Then we have this metadata. You know, all the data that the cursor has that your other applications don't normally get access to. Uh, so we have a connection. And then we have the database metadata get metadata. And then we have the, on the result set, we can do result set metadata get metadata, which is methods to get the data from the connection. How long has the connection been established? How long has the user been connected? So usually you get this with, um, actually it's very popular these days. You see, you know, you go in to buy tickets or something, and they set your connection, and you, know, you only have four minutes or three minutes. And you have to complete the transaction within four minutes. So you see a little timer on the top. Well, it's getting the connection time, and it's doing a countdown for you, because it's going to log you out, because otherwise we've got the record locked. And if you don't unlock that record, or you don't buy those tickets right now, we're going to open them up to somebody else. And so it's locking you in for a particular amount of time so you can finish your transaction. Otherwise, price is going to change. So you get this when you buy, um, sometimes when you buy airline seats, when you buy tickets to events, um, order something that has a fluctuating price associated with it. So. So here's a, uh, another thing here with the result set metadata and some of the things to consider. What's the number of columns in the result set? Well, you can get all of this information from the metadata. What's a, what's a column name? Uh, what's a column SQL type? Um, what's the suggested column title for using in the printouts and the display? Uh, what's a column's case matter? You know, does a column's case matter yet? It could. It could actually matter, you know, is it lowercase or uppercase? Because then you have to go, well, sometimes people, in fact, here's another little trick, actually. Sometimes people will capitalize the name of the column to tell you that the data that's in the column is also capitalized, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting trick. If you know, all of the last names are going to be capital letters, and last name, you're going to put last in capital L-A-S-T. So then you can tell automatically that all the data that's in there is capitalized. So when you write a form that's going to send data to the last name in, you're going to automatically capitalize the results. Also using a table, what tables are available. You can get all these, all these questions here are all things that you can ask of the metadata. So this is for the result set metadata, and this is for the database metadata. You can ask the database. In fact, this is how those programs are working, those automated user interfaces to the database where you can um, find out from the database what... Uh, you know, what, what tables do you have? What objects are created? What users are connected right now? Um, so you can basically monitor the activity and create new tables and stuff. So what's the username as known in the database? Is the database in read-only mode? Is the table uh, correlation names, are they supported? Um, you know, all the different information. So I'm not going to read you all the little statements there, but it's just some of the information you can get out of that. Useful methods of the data metadata. We can get column count, get column display size, get column name, get column type. Is it nullable? So imagine a case where you want to print the results. Well, then you can actually fix the report so the report makes sense. Nobody likes a report where half the data is missing or it says null in a column. That doesn't make very much sense to business managers. So instead, you're going to make it so if it says null, you're going to change it say, count closed or something, you know, something more meaningful in terms of the, the definition. What do you mean by null? So a lot of your report generators that are using JDBC connections to the database are automatically taking the results set, getting the metadata, making it more human readable in terms of the results that are coming back. So those reports look nice. So that's the difference between a nice looking report and one that looks like someone just took a dump from the database and took everything out in its raw form and printed it out on the screen, which not so popular, not so user friendly. So the database JDBC does some transaction management in terms of its design. It is not in a complete transaction manager. So a transaction is a sequence of SQL statements by definition. If you haven't heard of the concept. Transactions are not explicitly opened and closed. They're done manually and they're not, nothing happens automatically unless you put on a transaction manager. 
Instead, the connection has a state called auto commit mode. So this is what I was talking about before. So if auto commit is true, then every statement is automatically committed, which might actually sort of be a bad thing. Especially if, for example, you did a withdrawal, but you didn't do a deposit. You know, customer wants to transfer from one account to another, and you have auto commit on there, and the withdrawal works, but the deposit doesn't work. <laughs> because, you know, there was a storm on the East Coast, and all of a sudden, you know, power was lost in the middle of the transaction. Not such a good thing. The default case is true, however. So you actually sort of have to do your own manual kind of technique to figure out, well, what kind of transaction support can we put in? There's transaction managers that you can put in to the JDBC system because JDBC can be used along with RMI, along with Java transaction authorities, along with other Java components, which also makes it a little bit uh, more flexible that way as well. So here we have this auto commit. So on the connection, we can set the auto commit to on or set the auto commit to off. So if auto commit is false, then every statement is added in an ongoing transaction. And then at the end, we have to commit. If we don't commit, then we might end up losing the transaction. It's like, where'd my order go? It's lost completely. And then we roll back. So must explicitly commit or roll back the transaction using a connection.commit or connection.rollback, depending upon what you prefer to do. So for the connection manager, for a large threaded database, you create a connection and you use a manager object. So it's responsible for maintaining a certain number of open connections to the database. So it can take, well, we've already got five connections, so no more. Actually, what ends up happening is usually the client can't connect more than once. So it'll tell you, you're already connected. Would you like to disconnect before you connect again? Otherwise, you get one customer who's logged in five times and from five different computers. Or, you know, it's kind of like when you walk up to an ATM machine and you stick your card in. Imagine being able to do that five times simultaneously. How terrible that would be on the transaction <coughs> manager in terms of having to keep track of all these simultaneous connections. Not so good. Uh, so connection manager allows you to kind of play around with what, what each login is doing put a limit on it. It's responsible for maintaining a certain number of connections. And when your application needs a connection, you may ask for one from the connection pool. So you can create a connection pool. If you're, let's say, you're working, uh, you have in the company site, on the company server, you have a Oracle database running that's, uh, the, let's say you have, is connected to your POS system. And uh, you create, okay, we have five people working out um, on the store. Um, taking transactions through their mobile devices or something. Well, you can create a connection pool automatically for five people or for six people as an example. And then when the person connects from their mobile device to run your transaction, are you guys familiar with this? In California, they have it now. You don't actually walk up to a counter to pay for something in some stores. They walk out to you, which is kind of interesting with their mobile, usually their iPhone, they have a little card reader on there. They say, hey, you want to buy that? Okay. You know, the customers will be walking around browsing in the store and you, a, a salesperson shows up with their iPhone and rings you up right there. So you don't have to wait in line. Kind of like the Apple store. If you've ever been to an Apple store, they've been doing that for years. Now retail companies are doing that out here in California, actually. But those are using JDBC. <laughs> They're remote connections. They're not sitting there on a computer typing in a sales transaction, like you know the old-fashioned way of doing things. Instead, they're just barcode scanning your item and then they're emailing you a receipt. And they're using a network connection, using a JDBC or a similar type of interface. And they're working with a connection manager that's going to pull from a bunch of open connections that are already established. They're already sitting there on the network, which is a lot faster. Connect, send you back. And within two seconds, you're checked out. And then they can go on to the next customer using the same connection until they decide, oh, no more customers. OK, turn it off for right now. Save my battery. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, it's kind of an example of how it can be implemented these days. So, If you haven't, you actually should try that out just for the novelty of it. But in California, especially in San Jose, they don't give you bags anymore either. So it's kind of weird when you walk out of the store because you picked an item up off a shelf and you're holding on to it, right? And somebody walks up to you and you pay for it. And then you just walk out of the store with it. It's just weird. You know, it's like, how do you know I even paid for this? How does anyone even know, you know? But now it's like, it's kind of a big issue. 
because they don't want to give you out a paper bag or a plastic bag, so instead they'll spend twice as much money hiring a security guard to watch everything or put in video surveillance so they can watch you. What, isn't it just cheaper to give you a bag, make you walk up to a counter and check out? <laughs> so I don't know how much longer we're going to have the, this going on, but uh, there's a lot of theft going on, long story short. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do this, but you could walk into a store, pick something off the shelf, and walk out of the store with it. Nobody would look at you. Oh, whatever. And it's like, wait, wait, wait a minute. I didn't pay for it. Wait a minute. I don't even have a bag or a receipt or anything. Oh, no, no. Somebody walked over to me, and I did it on their phone. You know, they, you don't get a receipt there either. They, they don't even print. Well, some of them actually have little printer receipts for you. But a lot of times, you can just have it emailed to you. Well, that's the other thing, too. So you're, you're in, like, a, another store. You decide, well, I'm going to walk up to the counter. I'm not going to do the self-service. I want someone to check me out. They still ask you, would you like your receipt emailed to you? So they don't give you a printed receipt there either. How do you know you paid for the right items? The concept is completely lost on me because I, I can't check to make sure that I'm paying for it. You didn't charge me, like, twice for this? Am I going to find out later when I go home to check my email? <laughs> so I don't know. Technology is good to a certain point, and then it's gone overboard. Uh, so what I see, so when an application needs a connection, it just ask the connection manager. It will create one for them automatically. Or use a pool. Why? Because opening and closing connections takes a long time. So if we open and close the connections automatically, create a connection pool, automate the process, then it's a lot easier. And a warning, a connection manager should always set auto commit to false when the connection is returned. That way we don't automatically forget we have something in the queue and then commit it automatically. So we close the connection, but somebody was still using it. And half the transaction's done, but the rest of it's not done yet. And then we have uh, an issue with the transactions being lost. So for more information, you can go through the tutorial. And there's a tutorial out here on this website. It actually still works. The Java Sun actually is a... Uh, puts uh, learning materials out there. Not such a good thing. It's probably better to use, um, let's say, for example, mm -hmm. uh, online resources for books and things. Um, sometimes the, the manufacturer, or especially Oracle, actually, that stuff reads like, uh, if, you think, if you think I'm boring, that stuff, I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version of it, that stuff is like thick. That stuff is just like word after word. I mean, it's just long reading. This is way long-winded, so not worth it, actually. Not worth it at all. There's better tutorials out there, but now that I say it's not worth it, here's the URL again. <laughs> so. All right, so now I'm going to quickly go through an example here. We are going to take a break in another uh, 15 or so. I do have a watch on me, so I'm keeping track. Optimizing JDBC. Unless we want to take a break now. We can take a break now and come back. You guys need five minutes? Move around go to the bathroom? No? All right, we'll take a five minute, actually we'll take a 10 minute break, then we'll do into optimizing JWC. How's that? Because I know if you sit all day, your legs are going to be like sore. In fact, she already got up too. All right, so let's uh, take a 10 minute here. We'll reconvene in 10 minutes.